18, Romans chapter 10, verse 18. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? For Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. All right, so in verse 18, he says, But I say, surely they have not heard, have they? So Paul asks the question with every intent of asking, of answering it. And, and, uh, he asks it in the negative and then he turns the thing around. He says, indeed they have. Because by this time, by the time that this letter is written, every Jewish community in the world had been witnessed to. Uh, uh, and, and in, in many cases that may have even been Paul that did that. But Peter was, was quite active and, and, uh, so the word had gone out to the Jewish communities. The voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But in verse 19, he says, But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? And his response to this is, oh yeah, they knew. He says, for Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. And we talked about this last time. By something that is not a nation, namely the church. It's made up of all nations, namely the church. I'm going to make you jealous by them. And he's going to follow up on this concept uh, 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 twice as much in chapter 11. Um, uh, but it's as, as Jews see us and our lives and our families, it makes them jealous. It does make them jealous. I've seen this in my own life in working with Jews. And, uh, um, and then he says, by a nation without understanding, I will anger you. So I'm going to make you jealous by this no nation, by this church. It is no coincidence, therefore, that most Jews that come to know Jesus as their Messiah come through the witness of a Gentile. Many times people will contact me. Oh, you're Jewish. I have a Jewish friend. I'd like you to share with them. I say, I'm willing to share with them. you got to ask them, do you, do, you, do, you, do are they open to my sharing with them? But most Jews, including me, come to the Lord through the witness of a Gentile. It's through the witness of a Gentile. So, so Gentiles should not think that Jews have some monopoly on being able to share with other Jews. And in fact, it's harder for us in many cases because they view, the, 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 the typical view of a Gentile traditionally, traditionally within, within Jewish writings is the Gentiles were dogs. Alright? But, People like me that follow Jesus are traitors. A traitor is worse than a dog. And so that's traditionally. But even today, they will view people like me as a traitor following Jesus. So many times, Gentiles have more of an influence upon a Jew sharing with them. So keep that in mind. It's, it's not that Jews have some magic, magic way of sharing with other Jews. It's actually just the opposite. Most Jews that come to know the Lord come through the witness of, of a Gentile. And he says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation, verse 19, and by a nation without understanding, I will anger you. This is interesting. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And we're going to look at some cases of that today. Then he says, and Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. You think Jews have some special line of blessing from God? Gentiles have an enormous blessing. How do I know? It says it right there. I was found by those who did not seek me. He's speaking of the Gentiles. He says, they weren't seeking me and I was found by them. That means God must have put himself right in front of their face. They walked into him. They swerved into him. This is what God has done for the Gentiles. He has put himself right in front of them. Why does he do this? He tells us he does this to make the Jews jealous. That these people are going to be visited by God. They're going to have a relationship with God. And this is going to make the Jews jealous. 
This is all in God's plan of bringing the Jews into the kingdom. This is all planned by God. It's not something that, that, oh, he just happened to fall into because of the way things worked out. This was God's plan. It's written here in the Old Testament. His plan was to make them jealous for the Lord through the witness of Gentiles. He says, I was found by those who did not seek me. Boy, is he good to Gentiles. I became manifest. That means I became clear to those who did not ask for me. The Gentiles weren't asking for God. It wasn't like, you know, I, I, I sought Jesus and I found Jesus. No, you didn't find Jesus. He set himself right in front of you and you bumped into him. This is what he did for the Gentiles. This is how good he is to the Gentiles. So you think he's really good to Jews. He's super good to Gentiles. He, it says, I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. You weren't asking. You weren't asking for him. He put himself in front of you. He worked things out for you. So to the unbelievers who are here, God pours himself out for you. He pours himself out in witness to you. He does this. But as for Israel, he says, All day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. God is good to the Jews. They were disobedient. They were obstinate. He had given them time and time again. He gave them chances. And it says that he stretched out his hands. He stretched out his hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. He is good to everybody. God is so good to all people groups. This captured my attention in verse 20. So you you get a sense, you get a sense for what happens to me when I read the scriptures. And the same will happen to you if you ask of God to do this. So when you read the scriptures, don't just speed read this stuff. You take it very slowly. This is the difference between reading and meditation. There are far more verses in the Bible that speak of meditation than of reading the word of God. Far more that speak of the need to meditate upon the word of God. And the way you meditate is you read a verse. You, first you say, Lord, speak to me through this passage. Speak to me. And then you read a verse. And you read it again. And you read it again and say, Lord, speak to me. What do you say? And reflect upon it for a few moments. Then read the next verse. And say, Lord, what are you trying to say? Speak to me. And reflect upon it. And all of a sudden you feel volumes of stuff coming to you. It's different than reading a normal text. However you've learned how to read... Put that aside. I'm teaching you how to read. You're, you're, you're back in kindergarten. I'm teaching you how to read the Word of God in a meditative state. You read this again. And you read it again. You say, Lord, speak to me through this passage. What is it that you want me to, to, to see here? What is it that you want me to see? And, and He'll begin to speak to you through this passage. And so it says in verse 20, And Isaiah is very bold and says, Now, Paul was very bold. Paul was very bold. You just read about Paul in the book of Acts. I mean, he was as bold as can be. The guy got got pummeled with stones to the point where people thought he was dead. And he got right back and walked into the same town where they had just pummeled him with stones. He was very bold. But he says of Isaiah, not just that Isaiah was bold but that he was very bold. He says, Isaiah is very bold. Well, what's very bold? When he wrote, I was found by those who did not seek me, I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. He says, that was very bold of Isaiah to say that. Well, why would that be very bold? Well, because Paul Paul had experiences with this in his life. And... uh, uh, in, in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts chapter 22, even though Acts chapter 22 may well have occurred after this event, but this is characteristic of what Paul knew, the things that he knew about. And so in Acts chapter 22, Paul, before a mob, an angry mob that had tried to kill him, and some Roman soldiers delivered him by being torn apart by a mob, a mob of not angry Gentiles, but of angry Jews. A mob of angry Jews tried to to uh, 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 tear him to bits, and and so, and he was delivered by some Roman soldiers. And then, then what happened is that that uh, uh, he's given a chance to address this mob with the security of some Roman soldiers around him. So in Acts chapter twenty-two, verse one, it says, "Brethren, 
and fathers. Look, look what he calls the Jews. He doesn't just call uh, believers in Jesus brethren. He calls even Jews brethren, and we we saw that in Acts chap in, in Romans chapter ten verse one. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, in in the in the end of of Romans chapter nine, where he talks about his brethren, and and uh, um, uh, so so he calls them, but he does make this distinction: brethren and fathers. You look at what he even calls them. He calls them fathers. Because among them, among this crowd, are, are the leaders, the Jewish leaders, and he even refers to them as fathers, fathers. So you see the level of his respect. Acts chapter 22, verse 1. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you are today. So he introduces himself. They thought he was a Gentile. They thought he wouldn't know Hebrew. But he starts addressing them here in Jerusalem in Hebrew. And he says, I am a Jew. Paul never said, I am a Christian. He never said that. Other people called him Christian. King Agrippa says, you're going to make me into a Christian. Christian is what other people call them. Now, to the point where Peter says, don't be ashamed when they call you Christian. You know, rejoice in that name. But that's not something they referred to themselves. They referred to themselves as Jews. And even to this day, as I've told you, if you go to Israel, Messianic Jews, Jews who believe Jesus is the Messiah, rarely will refer to themselves as Christians. They will refer to themselves as Jews. And they refer to themselves as as believers, those believing in Jesus. But but they never lost their Jewishness. It's not like Paul converted to Christianity. No, he was a Jew. He was a Jew long before Christianity, the first name Christian, even started. They were first called Christians in Antioch. Years later, they were Jews. He says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, which means that now he's a Roman citizen and he made that point because the Roman soldiers are around him. He wants to underscore, I was born in Tarsus of Cilicia and Tarsus had been granted Roman status not long before Paul was born and that made him a Roman citizen. I was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, which means that he went he went to Harvard. I mean, this was the best you could get to be educated under Gamaliel. Strictly according to the law of our fathers, meaning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then these writers of of, of the law, Moses, being zealous for God, just as you are today. And even in in Acts, in in Romans chapter 10, he says that they have zeal, but it's not according to knowledge, not according to epigenosis, full knowledge. And he says, I I had zeal, just like you have. And then he goes and he just starts mapping out. So from verse 1... All the way down through verse the verse twenties of that chapter, he's mapping out how he came to the Lord. He's giving his testimony. The man is giving his testimony. When I share my faith with with people, I give my testimony. That's part of how I share the gospel. I give verses and I share my testimony of how I came to the Lord. He's sharing his testimony of how he came to the Lord, which you can read about in Acts chapter twenty-two. He re, he he he. Recast his testimony for them. but And everything is going well. They're listening to him. But then he gets down to verse 21 of Acts ch- chapter 22 and he says, uh, um, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 20, in Acts chapter 20, uh, Acts chapter 22, verse 20, verse 20 of Acts chapter 22. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I was also standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. And you can read about that earlier in the book of Acts, that when they were slaying the first martyr, Stephen, Paul, it says, was a young man, and he watched out for the cloaks of those who were throwing stones at him. Because you, you can't throw a stone when you got, you know, some cloak on, so you got to take off your cloak. So Paul is watching the cloaks while others are, are stoning Stephen. And uh, that's what it says in the book of Acts. And he says, I was in full agreement with this. I was against this, the, the, these believers as well. I was against them. And they're listening to him. 
And then he says in verse 21, And he said to me, meaning God said to me, and he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So he's giving his testimony and he says, And God said, God, yeah, I, I became converted and I, in heart, I became converted in heart and I was sent by God to witness to the Gentiles. Well, they were listening to him just fine up to this point. As soon as he said, I'm going to the Gentiles, read in verse 22, it says, And they listened to him up to this statement. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And they, and as they were crying out and throwing off their coats and tossing dust into the air, and then it goes on. I mean, they went crazy just because God sent them to the Gentiles. Remember what we said when we started Romans chapter 9. Remember what we said, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 are because God in Romans chapter 8 makes a bunch of promises to us. And we could rightly say, well, if he hasn't kept the promises to the Jewish people, how do we know he's going to keep them to us? And so in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, what he does is he shows us that it was because of spiritual pride and self-sufficiency, spiritual self-sufficiency and pride by the Jewish people that these things have come upon them. But as he's going to show us is that is that every promise that he made to them is going to come to pass. All promises made are going to come to pass. And then he's going to pick it up in, in Romans chapter 12 and start talking about it. But as soon as he said, I'm going to the Gentiles, they went crazy. This is exactly what he says it, uh, about what Isaiah said. Isaiah was very bold in saying that I'm going to be found by the Gentiles, by those that don't know me. Because this made the Jews go crazy to think that God would go to Gentile dogs rather than us. Because we work so hard doing all our little things, saying all our little prayers and trying to observe all of this law. And God is going to go to the Gentiles? No way. This is what he's talking about. He says, it's going to anger you. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. You see this anger. The same thing happens to Jesus. So, so if you look in, in Luke, in Luke chapter, chapter four, Luke chapter four, uh, in Luke chapter four, early on in Jesus' ministry, in Luke chapter four, Jesus saw the same sort of thing happen to him. Everything was fine until he said, God is going to minister to the Gentiles. So I want you to watch out for this as we read this, and you can be observant for, for what's going to happen. In Luke chapter 4, verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him was spread throughout through all the surrounding district, and he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. So Jesus went up to the Galilee in the power of the Spirit. This means he's witnessing, he's sharing, he's healing the sick, he's doing all sorts of things. And and uh, uh, news about him spread. If he was just walking around the Galilee, who cares, a man walking around? No, he was doing amazing things. He was doing amazing things in the Galilee. This is this is up by the, 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 the Sea of Galilee, the, 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 the Sea of Knesset. He's there in Galilee. And, and Nazareth is not far from there. And then, so then he goes back to Nazareth, the town in which he was grown up. Remember, he was born in Bethlehem. His family fled to Egypt when they were going to kill all the, the children in, in that, that part of Judea in, in the Bethlehem area. And then he came back in and his family settled in Nazareth. So this is where he grew up in verse 16. And he came to Nazareth. Nazareth this is Luke chapter 4, verse 16, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord." And he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down, and all eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him, and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? Okay, so he goes back to Nazareth, and he's in the synagogue, as was his practice. 
It says that, that uh, as was his custom in verse 16, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. So the Sabbath to them was on Friday they go to the synagogue and on Saturday they go to the synagogue. So Friday sundown to Saturday sundown is the Sabbath day. And they would go to the to the synagogue. And you go to Israel, you see the Orthodox Jews going on Friday evening. You see the, the Orthodox Jews. And then they come home and they have their, their, their Friday night meal together. And they all go on Saturday. Big, big deal to go on Saturday. And so he, he, he goes in, into the Sabbath as was his custom. This was his custom to do this. So they would go to the synagogue. Did you know the synagogues are not written about in the law of Moses? Nothing about synagogues in the law of Moses. Synagogues were local places of worship. What was written about in the law of Moses was, was, uh, uh, to have the tabernacle and then the temple that was talked about. That was in Jerusalem, but they came up with this concept of local places of worship. So something that was not in the scriptures, they came up with and God sanctioned it. Jesus himself visited the synagogues. He didn't just go all the way down to Jerusalem, which would take days to walk it. You know, now you could drive from Nazareth to Jerusalem, I don't know, like an hour and a half or something. Uh, you could you could make that drive. But, you know, this would be days of walking to be able to do this. So they came up with local places of worship. So not everything that God sanctions is in the Bible. He gives people freedom to come up with things. So Jesus is in the synagogue, thereby sanctioning that, hey, this is a good place to be. And it was his custom to be there. This is why I stress with young people, you really ought to be in, in church on Sunday. You really ought to be. And, and you know, we can use the verse Hebrews 10.25. Do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together as is the habit of some, but come together and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we can use this verse and people, well, where, where does it say you have to be in church on Sunday? Well, it's a good custom to have because there's going to come a time you're going to have children. And you want them to have this good custom. And I've known guys that say, well, you know, we just kind of worship at home and we go fishing. I take my boys fishing. Well, it's not long before the, the family just starts scattering on Sundays and the kids get grow up and they have no desire to be part of the church because it was not important in the parents' life. I've seen this many, many times. It's very important to be a part of a local church and to have that community. So Jesus is there in the synagogue, and a custom in the synagogue, if there is a, a man who you consider to be a good teacher, that person can do the teaching that day. There was real openness to that. And you go into an Orthodox synagogue today, they will stand to read the scriptures, and then they will sit down to teach. They will sit down. You say, that, that's, that's, that's so weird. They sit down to teach. No, what's weird is the way Baptists do it to stand to teach up. Teach. The Bible has it, people sitting down to teach. Jesus, you see this custom, this, this way he often did it. You know, he, he, he went into the boat and he sat down in order to, to teach. He sat down. So he opens the book and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah, or the scroll of Isaiah, so they open these big scrolls, you go into, the, there were no books then, they open up the scroll, and they, and, and you have a tool, you have a, a little piece of metal that go, that you put underneath it so that you can read it, because it's, it's a long way across the scroll, so you don't lose your line, and then you pull down one and you can see the next line to go to. So he reads this, and so what you would do is you would, in, in the synagogue, you were given a portion to read. You didn't just willy-nilly, ah, uh, I think I'll read this portion. No, there was a set portion to read from the Torah, from, from the first five books of Moses, and then you'd read from the prophets, like Isaiah, a complementary portion, but it was the same in every synagogue, as it is to this day. And so he read this portion from Isaiah, and he closed the book, he gave it back down, and he sat down. It's not like he went back into the into the congregation and sat down. No, he, he's still up on the stage there. He's still up on the platform there. He, now he sits down and he's going to teach as a rabbi would teach today. They teach from the sitting position. He sat down and began to teach them. And he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And everybody was speaking well of him, clapping. Don't we know him? Yes, this is Joseph's son. We know him. Everybody loved him. They were all, it says they were all, and they began to say of him, uh, and all were speaking well of him. Everybody was speaking of well of him. So they loved the guy. This guy's from our own hometown. He's homeboy done, done well. You know, he's gone out and, uh, 
let's, let's, let's see him do some things here in our town too. And so what does Jesus say to them? Verse 23, and he said to them, no doubt you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. So he says, you say to me, physician, heal yourself. In other words, you want me to do here what you heard that I did in Capernaum, these other towns in the Galilee. You want, you, you want me to do this? He says, a prophet is, is, never has honor in his own home. They never are going to respect him in his own home. And then he tells them a story. These are a bunch of people that really are speaking well of him. And you wonder, why did Jesus do this? Now in verse 25, he tells them this story. And he's just quoting, he's just telling them Old Testament passages, which they know. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the land, and yet Elijah was sent to no, to none of them but to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage, and as they heard these things, they got up and they drove him out of the city and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through the midst, he went his way. I mean, how is that for, for being canceled? I mean, this is like the ultimate. The guy said one, told them two stories from the Old Testament. He tells them about how Elijah was sent up to this woman in, in, in Sidon and he, to, to a, 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 a Gentile woman and he took care of her during a famine even though there were many starving widows in Israel. He went to the Gentiles. Then he tells them a story of Elisha. Elisha who through him, he healed the leper, Naaman, who was a Syrian general. There were no lepers in, in Israel being saved. In fact, from the completion of the law, from the time of the completion of the law, until Jesus, no Jew had ever been healed of leprosy, even though you have like two and a half chapters of what to do with a Jewish leper. Jesus just blew everything away. But in any case, so you see, you see here that he tells them two stories from their own scriptures, and what they read from this is, God is going to minister to the Gentiles and not us. And this made them angry enough to say, we are going to take him out and we are going to throw him off a cliff. And they physically took him out to throw him off a cliff. Jesus spoke the truth. Jesus shared with them the truth. This whole idea of sharing the truth, this whole idea, that's why... So let's go back to Romans chapter 10, verse 20. And Isaiah is very bold when he says this, that God is going to go to the Gentiles. He spoke the truth. Paul recognizes this as being very bold because this gets, this gets the Jews irate. There are things that upset the culture that are true. I have heard it said, and I think it is certainly true, that there are many academics... Many professors in the university, in the academy, many academics that have the intellectual chops, that have the intellectual prowess of C.S. Lewis and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But they never affect their generation because they're cowards. That the biggest problem within the academy is it's filled with cowards. Because professors want to be accepted by their peers. They want their papers published. They want their funding. So they don't speak up the truth. And I have seen this time and time again. And professors who will stand and take a stand on that which is true. The very truth that their own data is showing. They won't speak it up. And you say, well, what's the evidence of this? Look at Nazi Germany. The professors, the academy went along with the Nazis. They just hunkered down and kept their mouths shut. And they knew that this was wrong. They knew that this, this whole sequence of the things that they were saying were wrong. And they went, a, went, a, went accord with it. Same thing happened in, in, the, in Soviet Russia. The professors went along with the Soviets, hoping that no persecution would come to them. There are many people that are as smart as C.S. Lewis and, and uh, um, 
and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but they don't affect their generation. The people that affect their generation are people who speak up and speak the truth. But it's always as a cost. And Jesus took that cost. He took the cost to the point where all these people were against him. His whole hometown wanted to kill him. Paul paid that price. He said what was true, that he had been sent to the Gentiles, knowing that it was going to make these people go ballistic. Because Paul was going to use this as a mechanism to get to Rome. Paul was very sharp in what he was doing. But he didn't pull any punches. And he spoke the truth. I see this over and over again. The data, the data on origin of life screams out that we are clueless on how life originated scientifically. Yet scientists go along with all of these silly little scenarios that if you just put RNA because it's a ribozyme inside a lipid bilayer, that you'll get, you'll, after a few million years, you'll get life. This is a bunch of nonsense and they know it. And I came up with this series and I have had multiple professors come to my office and tell me that they agree with me. They won't even write it in an email. But they said, I watched your thing and I agree with you. But don't tell people that I said it. Because they're cowards. Because what happens is you get canceled so that you don't get grants anymore. You get canceled because, because your community doesn't want to see your papers published. They don't want to see you advance. And because they are cowards, what lacks in the academy is courage. Courage to speak the word, to speak the truth, like these men had. They were speaking the truth. He said Isaiah was very bold. This is why he's calling this out. He knew that when you say something like this, that God is going to go to the Gentiles, this is going to make them go crazy. And we have two examples of it. Just I read you just two. There's more examples of this in the scripture. Happened to Paul. Happened to Jesus. When you speak up, you will be canceled. But when you speak up, you will affect your generation. And you know the outcome of this also? Sometimes you get crushed. Sometimes that happens. James was killed early on and martyred. His brother John was the oldest disciple that was left. We don't know whether you're going to be James or whether you're going to be John. We don't know. You don't know what the outcome is when you stand in courage. But in the Word of God, there is this desire, that this propensity that we are told to be courageous. We are told to be courageous. And many times, what I have seen with my own eyes, to those who will stand for the Lord, to those who will take a stand, God blesses them differently. I get my funding through industries, through companies, because we file all these patents which form companies. And I tell the companies, if you want to be able to license this patent, you've got to give a million dollars to my research group. You say, that, that's blackmail. Yeah, it's blackmail. You want to do this? You, you want this? you got to pay a million dollars to my research group. It's the fee. It's the fee. And that, through that, I can, public, I, I can fund my big research group. Because you get canceled by the establishment. But God provides another mechanism. And He gives you more and more inventions. What I've seen in my own life, there is no way. I don't know anybody who has so many amazing inventions. Well, I do know one guy, one other person in the world that has so many amazing inventions that just turn these things out. This is not me. Many of these come by my students in my lap. God is just dropping this in my lap. This is exactly what he says, exactly what he talks about, where where he says that, that he's going to put these things into your lap. So, for example, in Luke chapter 6, in Luke chapter 6, It says in verse 38, Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. For by your standard of measure will be measured to you. God is pouring into my lap inventions. Every weekend I come home, my daughter says to me, she says, how many patents did you file this week? You know, because I usually work on patents on Saturdays. I mean, just one after another after another. It's crazy. I have seen the blessing of God. When you take a stand for that which is true, when you stand for the Lord, God blesses you in many ways. The world comes against you, but God blesses you. But most people are afraid, afraid to do this. And they never impact their community. They never impact the world. Some people are afraid to come to know the Lord. They're afraid of how it's going to disrupt their life. But there's great blessing in knowing the Lord. There's great blessing. Some people are afraid to come to the Lord for, because what their friends are going to say. But there's great blessing in come to the, coming to the Lord. 
I urge you to be courageous. I urge you. This is what we see. Jesus was courageous. Paul was courageous. Isaiah was courageous. And it affected their generation. C.S. Lewis was courageous. He took on the establishment. It affected his generation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was courageous. It affected his generation. Even though he was killed for it, it affected his generation. And many generations to come. And all those academics that kept their mouths shut, they're dead and gone and nobody remembers them. You walk in courage and there is great blessing. You don't and the community will stroke you, but you will be forgotten. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your word because through your word, it gives us courage to walk like Jesus, to walk like Isaiah, to walk like Paul that you have set before us these men that go before us and these women like Deborah who took a stand who boldly proclaimed things like Mary who was the servant of the Lord to go through the talk of the community to bear Jesus Lord Jesus I thank you for what you have shown before us and I pray for these young people that you would cause them to be courageous in their lives that they would be courageous, that they would affect their generation. And I don't know if it's going to cause them to be be even killed like James early on or to be given a long life like John. You have your own ways, Lord, but they affect their generation. Father, raise up men and women, I pray, that will affect this generation. Lord, do this, I pray. Lord, among these young people, I pray that you would even raise up academics, you would raise up professors that would take a stand for that which is true, that would stand for that which is right, even if they're going to be canceled, even if they're going to be abused by their their very own profession, by their own peers. Father, that they would take a stand for that which is true. Father, give us courage, I pray, to walk according to your word. And Lord, I pray for unbelievers that they would come to the Lord this very day. Father, that they would lay down this, this, this fear and that they would come to Jesus. Lord, affect this generation through these young people. That Jesus would be glorified. That Jesus would be glorified in their lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.